You know by now that we're all about the journey. June's journey, that is. Like, I feel this game was made for us specifically. It's the closest I've come to feeling like I've been dropped in the middle of a mystery novel set in the 1920s. That's because you get to play as June, a globe-trotting flapper slash amateur sleuth who lives to solve mysteries. You get to visit all sorts of fascinating places, from Paris to Cuba. You beat levels by identifying hidden objects in the scene. And we found that the more we play, the sharper our observational skills become. The game is delightful and a wonderful way to relax. I'll often pull my phone out and play it when I've got a free moment, like I'm on hold with an archive or I'm waiting for a courthouse to open up in the morning. I'm currently on Chapter 16, meaning I'm searching for the son of June's housekeeper, who's on the run from New Orleans gamblers and the police. It's a wild time. We know our audience is filled with folks who love a good mystery. Now is your chance to try your hand at being a sleuth yourself. Discover your inner detective when you download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android. Content warning. This episode contains discussion of murder and violence. Also, if you have information pertinent to Peggy's case, please contact the authorities. We will discuss how to do so at the conclusion of the episode. The river still flows by the house where Peggy Lammers died. In the sun, the water is blue and serene. On stormy days, whitecap waves splash up against the all-but-abandoned waterfront property. The house is mostly empty now. It was once a haven for Peggy's family. Now, it sits at the confluence of those happy memories and a newer source of devastating pain. Somebody murdered Peggy at the River House. That killer has gotten away with it for six years. Many of Peggy's loved ones can't go back to the house. Not yet. So the River House sits, waiting. In 1970, Peggy's parents, Dr. John L. and Marjorie Thornton, built the summer house. They bought property in the unincorporated community of Deltaville, Virginia, in Middlesex County. The sliver of land where they made their purchase is known as Stove Point. Accessible by one single lane, Stove Point juts into the mouth of the Piankatank River as it pours into Virginia's Chesapeake Bay. It's idyllic and attracts vacationers from all around. Painted a pale bluish gray, the house where Peggy died was unfussy and primed for summer vacations, with its wooden deck, pool, and plenty of windows to capture the river view. For years, her family called it the River House. It was their refuge, a place to get away from the hustle and bustle of life and enjoy each other's company. Peggy was close with her family. Her father, John, was a well-established physician in Richmond, Virginia, who helped to found Physicians Clinical Laboratories. That would ultimately get absorbed into a company now known as LabCorp, one of the world's biggest laboratory networks. Peggy's mother, Marjorie, was a medical technologist who enjoyed sitting on the deck of the river house watching the moon, the stars, the rising sun, and the rare green flash that sometimes streaks across the horizon at dusk or dawn. John would sit by her side, sipping Negronis. Peggy herself started a family with Anthony Joseph, or Tony Lammers, a businessman from Ohio. Police told us they met working for her father's company. Peggy and Tony had three children together. The Lammers predominantly lived in Cleveland, but they often took the kids to the river house. In Peggy's obituary, her children referred to her as the best mom ever. Over the years, Peggy would undergo heartbreak. In 2015, her mother died. Peggy stepped in to take care of her father, who was struggling with a severe anemic condition until his death in 2016. In the aftermath, she continued to travel between Ohio and Virginia, taking care of her parents' estate. She spent much time in her hometown, Richmond, with her sister Anne's family. In 2017, she celebrated the 4th of July at the River House with her husband Tony and one of their children. After a long weekend, they departed for Ohio, while Peggy left to go back to Richmond. On Saturday, July 8, 2017, Peggy returned to the Stove Point house. She stayed in contact with her family and decided to stay at the River House just a little bit longer. But by July 11, 2017, she was dead, murdered in a house she loved, 
by the banks of the river where she and her family had spent so much time. The Piankatank is a winding river, hard to navigate. It seeps down from Dragon Run, carving through Virginia's Middle Peninsula, between its sisters, the Rappahannock and the York. A successful homicide investigation can resemble a crooked river in retrospect. There's the headwaters, the deluge of violence where it all begins. There's erosion, the wearing down of anything caught in its path. There's the churning past obstacles like stifling swamps and twists into tiny tributary creeks that lead nowhere. There are different tempos, a rush over rapids or a placid surface, as quiet and languid as a night in July. For anyone navigating such a path, the river can seem to stretch on endlessly. But finally, when the river reaches its end, like where the Pianca tank meets the Chesapeake, it resembles an inevitability. Something ancient, something that had always been there, relentlessly flowing to its destination. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. We first connected while looking into the Burger Chef murders, an Indiana cold case. Together, we built a spreadsheet documenting hundreds of cases of restaurant-related homicides. That original spreadsheet gave way to our podcast, The Murder Sheet. Now we maintain that same research-centric, investigative approach as we look into all sorts of homicides, including unsolved cases, historical crimes, and, of course, restaurant murders. We don't just chat about the headlines. Our podcast is a platform for our journalism. The Murder Sheet focuses on investigative reporting, thoughtful analysis, thorough research, and in-depth interviews. We're the Murder Sheet. And this is Death Comes to the River House, the murder of Peggy Thornton Lammers. Peggy's case is not yet solved, but it is far from cold. As you will hear in this episode, police have a lot of information about this crime. They have details to share about the scene. They do not believe a stranger killed Peggy. They will explain just why that is and go into the staging of the scene and the bizarre decisions the killer made. They will also share that they have a person of interest. They are working to gather enough evidence to move forward with a prosecution and ultimately, a conviction. They feel they are close to securing justice for a woman whose loss devastated her friends and family. Listen up, because they need our help to close this one out. They need just a bit more information. They need anyone who's sitting on that information to speak up and set down the burden they've been carrying for so long. We were fortunate enough to get an interview with three investigators on this case from two different agencies. You'll hear from them now. Sure, this is Detective Chris Gatling. I'm Detective John Grappa with Middlesex County. Special Agent Mark Matthews, FBI Richmond. I guess to start out with, I'll just sort of jump into my questions if that's okay with everybody. Yeah, sure. Awesome. Can you all give us a bit of relevant background on the victim, in this case, uh, Margaret or Peggy Thornton Lammers? Sure. So Peggy and her family, her parents bought the River House, what they refer to as the River House, in the county of Middlesex, Deltaville, Virginia. And it's on an area called Stove Point. And that house was bought in uh, 1970 by her parents. And so uh, they would frequent that home in the summertime qu quite often. She met Tony through her father's business. He was a gentleman, a doctor, that started a company here in Virginia called LabCorp. 
it was blood samples, different samples and things. He would eventually sell that before he died, I believe. But they met through Peggy working for her father and then Tony working for Dr. Thornton as well. And he was originally from Cleveland, Ohio. My understanding is that she was staying, obviously, in Virginia at the time of her death. But at that point, like, how long had it been since she was living in Ohio with her husband? Their mother passed away in January of 2015. In February of 2016, their father was diagnosed with a plastic anemia. And since their kids were grown, she decided to come down to Richmond and take care of him 24-7 until he died. And he passed away on November the 2nd, 2016. And in between that time until June of 2017, they would go back and forth trying to figure out about the estate and things like that. At the time of her death, her father having just recently died, did did she inherit a substantial sum of money through that estate? Or were there any other issues with his estate? She and her two other siblings did inherit a large amount of, of money that goes along the state. But both the parents had acquired properties and such over time. So it was three three siblings total. Was she having personal problems at the time, or did she have any known enemies at that time? There has been no evidence to suggest that Peggy had any enemies whatsoever. I, I wonder if you could help set the scene a bit. What is Deltaville, Virginia like? I mean, we understand it's not exactly a high crime or high traffic area, and that it's a place where, like, wealthy people from Richmond often vacation in the summer. Is that an accurate sure. assessment? Sure. So Deltaville is known as the boating capital of the Chesapeake. And there are marinas throughout the whole county. A lot of our land mass is actually shoreline. It, it is bordered by, one side is bordered by the Rappahannock, the other side, the Piankatake, and the tip of Middlesex County is, opens up to the Chesapeake Bay kind of like a, a semi-peninsula, actually. People from all over northern Virginia and north of Virginia come down and they, they have their homes there. It is in the summertime. In short, our population increases at least three times in the summertime. And it's a relatively safe area, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Narrowing in a bit on um, Stove Point Road, can you tell us a bit about that we understand it was a single laden street and it was the only point of access to the residence where Peggy was unfortunately murdered. Yeah, that's correct. Stowe Point is a narrow landmass that jets out into the uh, Pink Tank River. And one side of that forms what the, uh, it's called Fishing Bay. And their house was actually on the side that opens up to the Chesapeake Bay, the Rappahannock Chesapeake Bay side. And it, it is. It's one way in, one way out. It's not lined or paved. I believe it's gravel, actually, thinking of, about it. It is only so many houses out there. You mentioned the family-owned residence there that Peggy was staying in had been in the family for, for decades. Is there anything else you can tell us about that residence? Well, the kids, the adult siblings, recall growing up there, having fond memories. Of course, Peggy's other two sibling families would go there as well for family get-togethers and whatnot. Uh, and I believe that her sister, Ann Ferguson, and her husband have another house just up the road from, from there. If we'd like to further describe kind of a little bit about their residence. So as he described the single lane road that kind of leads into the water, if you just continue on, there's nothing else back there, just a single lane road. The house actually sits back off of that road and is covered pretty heavily by tree and foliage not a direct view from that single road to the residence, which I think is an important part of this investigation. Understood. Um, thank you for clarifying that. We've talked a lot about how great HelloFresh is when it comes to meals. They really want you to have it all, free time and delicious food. That's why they take care of all the meal planning and even ship the ingredients right to your door so you've got everything you need to make a wonderful meal for yourself and your family. But let's chat a moment about a side of HelloFresh we didn't know about ourselves until very recently. I'll be honest. I don't just eat at mealtimes. During the day or when I'm relaxing in the evening, I like to munch on snacks or sides. And I assumed that was something HelloFresh could not help me with. So I would still have to trudge out to the grocery store and stand in line to get those sorts of treats. But I was wrong. Let me tell you about HelloFresh Market. It lets you shop online and take your pick from a curated selection of over 100 items, including all sorts of tasty treats and desserts. 
and it will all be added to your weekly HelloFresh delivery. It's the best of meal kits and online grocery shopping combined in one weekly box. This is another great reason to try out HelloFresh. And remember, Murder Sheet listeners get a special discount. Go to HelloFresh.com slash MSheet50 and use code MSheet50 for 50% off plus free shipping. Again, go to HelloFresh.com slash MSheet50 and use code MSheet50 for 50% off plus free shipping. Try out America's number one meal kit today. We are so delighted to work with our sponsor, Brilliant Earth. This is a company that offers some of the most brilliant and romantic engagement rings and wedding bands out there, all the while ensuring a commitment to ethical sourcing and sustainability. If you're looking to get married or to become engaged, or even if you're just searching for a special piece of fine jewelry, you have to check out their website. They make browsing so easy. They even let you design your own perfect engagement ring, or you can shop by style. I love the delicate willow rings, along with the three stone Nadia rings and the classic Frisia rings. It's so hard to choose. And you don't have to worry about the ethical implications of your purchase. Your special gift, your engagement ring, your wedding band should never be tarnished by the idea that the gems or materials came from an abusive system. See, Brilliant Earth has a commitment to beyond conflict-free diamonds. That means one thing. They only accept diamonds from mining operations and countries that strictly follow international labor, trade, and environmental standards. Fewer than 1% of other diamond suppliers meet Brilliant Earth standards. You can feel good about your purchase, knowing that you're supporting a brand that actually cares about its ethical impact and is committed to fostering better standards in the jewelry business. Check out all of their beautiful pieces at BrilliantEarth.com. That's BrilliantEarth.com. One thing I was just curious about was, according to her family and friends, was it unusual for Peggy to be staying at that house by herself? Not to my knowledge, no. That's never been revealed to, to, to be the case. And then just to kind of further scene set... I mean, you mentioned the family kind of all stayed there and had these happy memories there. Was it typically pretty high traffic for them in the summer, that house, like going back and forth? Or or was it something that it was more of an occasional getaway house? From my understanding, it sounds like the summertime and things like that. In describing the property, once you turn into the driveway, as you look at the bay from the, the back of the house, there's a house next door separated by clearing a field uh, or just no foliage or, or trees. To the right was a, another house that had trees, and, a, and it was a two-story house and had a fence. But on the property, on the Thornton's property, there was a pool house, too, and an in-ground pool. So when people came, they had the pool house also to stay in. And from my knowledge, from, from going over the case, there's nothing talked about other than primarily the summertime time frame of them going there. In terms of the proximity of those other buildings, I guess, would people have had a clear view from some of those of, of the house? I mean, would I'm just kind of sort of riffing on what you mentioned. I mean, was it a situation where, you know, it was kind of... They have an association out there and they are connected through email and, and that type of thing. What can you tell us about the timeline of events leading up to Peggy's murder? On June 26th, Peggy returned to Richmond, and what she did, she was in Ohio, and she spent her son's, Jay Lambert's birthday there and, and Father's Day there. And then she returned to Richmond from Ohio on the 26th. And then on June 30th, for the 4th of July weekend, she was met at the River House by her sister Anne, her husband Tony, and their oldest daughter, Ann Jordan, who goes by AJ. On the 4th of July... Anne's husband and Tony and AJ returned back to Ohio. And on the 5th, Anne and Peggy returned to Richmond to go to Anne's home. And then on Saturday the 8th, Peggy returned to the River House from Richmond. And then she's discovered murdered on July the 11th in the evening. Our understanding is that Peggy indicated to her sister on July 10th that she intended to sort of stay at the house a bit longer and that her 7 p.m. call that night to her sister was the last time they talked. Is that correct? We got that from media reports. 
I, I can confirm for you that she intended to stay longer, yes. I'm not sure exactly what time frame is without it being in front of me, her cell records right now. Peggy's last phone call was at 514 on the 10th. Not sure who was. I don't know if it was to her sister or not, though. Right. And we have a, a last text message at 7.13 p.m. Um, the last data usage for Peggy's phone is at 1.18 a.m. on that will be the 11th. Yeah. Understood. In any of those final communications or even data usage, was there any indication that something was wrong? No. What's interesting about all that is that her cell phone was not at the scene. It's not been recovered. Oh, my God. Wow. Um, for the 1 a.m. data usage, I'm just curious about that to kind of highlight that a little bit. Is that just uh, the, could that indicate something as simple as somebody turning on the phone or like looking something up on the Internet? The data you see, anything social media related, anything searched on Google, anything you would use other than text or a phone call, that data usage is, is what that would be. Got it. Peggy was known to be on Facebook a lot, so I think that could have been oh, right. the data usage is just scrolling through Facebook. So, so like also that. to add to that, so Peggy would play games on her phone. That's what she did. She would play different games on her phone, and that took a lot of her time <laughs> sitting there, from what I understand, talking to friends and family. That's what she liked to do. Got it. So that's not that's not out of the ordinary for her? No. What's out of the ordinary is her cell phone's not there, right? Yeah and powered off or died soon after that 118 usage. That's really, really bizarre. And I mean, I'm, I have to ask this. I, I, I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but like, there's no way to trace where it is, right? Right. Not in the off or powered down position. Right. You, it, yeah. It, your phone's inactive. You're not tracing that. Mm hmm Yeah. Um, Wow. And I mean, that's, I mean, just speaking from the perspective of your law enforcement experience, is that unusual to have a, a homicide scene where the victim's phone is actually missing, unaccounted well, for? So your question is, is it normal for a crime scene for a cell phone to be powered off in that manner, correct? Yes, that's right. Our belief in this investigation is whoever perpetrated this murder was very knowledgeable about how law enforcement can utilize cell phone and cell phone usage and data and tracking measures in an investigation and was very cognizant of that and was able to power down that device uh, soon after the murder. Wow. Unless there's anything you guys wanted to mention otherwise about the phone, I might just say, you know, in, in terms of if we if you can kind of tell us anything that's shareable about the discovery of her body on July 11th. The autopsy report came back, and that was shared with members of the family. From the the examiner shared with actually her husband that she was bludgeoned to death, and he shared that with the family. And so, the attack was such a way where it did not fracture her skull. So she suffered blunt force trauma, but in the end, she bled to death. So it didn't fracture her skull, and her skull and brain were intact. Her thumb was dislocated. She had no stab wound. I understand that she was found after an officer performed a welfare check at the residence around 6 p.m. on July 11th. That's correct. And are there any thoughts that you can share, very much understand if you can't, about when the coroner believed she was killed timeline-wise? They didn't. Uh, you know what? In Virginia, they don't do a lot of... In fact, that's, that's absent from the report. They don't give a estimated time of, of death. That's nowhere in the autopsy report. We kind of reviewed the FBI's YouTube channel video that sort of kind of talked a little bit about some of the details of the scene. And we also read media reports indicating that some handbags in the house had been spilled. We noticed in the video like a knocked over telescope and like a broken ceiling fixture. I mean, were the, was the house ransacked? Is that a fair description or was it really only those kind of specific issues? So let me start back with the welfare check, if you don't yeah, mind. Please and do. So the sheriff's office received a welfare check from Tony Lammers, who was Peggy's husband. And that prompted the deputy to arrive on the scene. But I'll give you a little snapshot of what the deputy saw. So the deputy went to the front door of the home, which faces the roadside of their property. And he knocked on that door 
there was no answer. It was locked. He had noticed a footprint on the door, and the screen was a little bit broke, uh, torn. He went around to the back and saw to his right was the house that's approximately 40 to 50 yards away. They were having a party. He walked over there. Hey, is anyone named Peggy Lammers that is over here? They said no. He and a neighbor walked back to the back deck. The neighbor stayed on the deck. She did not enter the home. He noticed that the sliding glass door on the back deck, now that's facing the water side, of course, was opened about a foot and a half, two feet. He saw the telescope on the floor, and he walked forward to where you'd come to the hallway that goes to the bedrooms, and that's when he discovered Peggy's murdered body on the floor there. One question I had about her, the state she was in is just, was... Is there a sense if this was a prolonged attack or a quick ambush or anything like that? She suffered blunt force trauma. It looks like something that happened very quickly. I don't know if she was unconscious or not. I would assume, I would hope so that she was actually, but it looked like it was very violent and very quick. Were there uh, any defensive wounds? No. Is there anything you can tell us about physical evidence or potentially DNA collected at the crime scene? There was DNA collected at the crime scene. Is it relevant? It is relevant. Okay. It's relevant to eliminating certain aspects of that crime. We also understand in terms of physical evidence that there may have been bloody shoe prints at the crime scene. Was it was it a very bloody crime scene, first of all, and is that is that accurate? That is accurate. Uh, I'm not going to go into details about the shoe print, but okay. That's okay. totally fine. Totally. Were there any indications of how long the perpetrator may have remained at the scene? No. Were there any signs of how the perpetrator may have gained access to the scene? Well, there was no forced entry, and that sliding glass door was already open, and it only locked from the inside. So I would say this. So if, if anyone's thinking, oh, it could have been a stranger, a stranger doesn't know who's there how long they're going to be away from home, you know, just, just to say, oh, a stranger did it, right? Uh, say there's a defense event, right? Well, again, the location of the crime scene, far off the beaten path. She's discovered in the evening time. Her phone went off at 1.10 in the morning or so. It is dark, right? Yes, dark gives one cover, but there are still neighbors. It's summertime, right? I don't know anyone's bedtimes, but a person, a stranger, doesn't know, again, who's there, who's at home. All those unknowns. There's too many unknown variables for a stranger just to pick that house that night and, in my opinion, do what they did. And I will share this with you. At this time, there's no evidence to show a stranger scenario. I don't know if that makes sense to you or not. Makes a lot of sense. What and, you're... and if they were going there to ransack the residence, like Chris was saying, they would wait a couple more months when they know no one's going to be there. Right. Now, having said that, suffice to say, I, I believe this scene was staged. And to talk a little bit about the house and how it's set up and how Peggy was known to answer the front door. When you walk onto the front porch and you're standing at the door, right to your left is a window that goes into one of the bedrooms there. Peggy was known to walk up to that window and check that window to verify who was on that front porch. And she would never, she was known to never let anybody in that she did not know. What you're saying, just the kind of the geography of this, so to speak, and, you know, some of the details about her lifestyle there and the area definitely seem to indicate that somebody would be cognizant of a lot of this information going in. Is there anything you can tell us about a potential suspected murder weapon? My theory is she was kicked to death, causing the scalp to split without fracturing the skull and she bled to death. I think a person has better control over their limb than a secondary object in their hand. That's my theory. But there has not been any specific murder weapon that was recovered from the scene. The knife that was found in the sink had blood on it, uh, which was Peggy's, but we know from the autopsy that that was not ever used. We talked a bit about the Stove Point Road kind of area, and I mean, is there any hope or any, you know, potentially at least slightly helpful footage that could identify a vehicle or how this perp may have arrived? So far, there's nothing been uh, that has been produced to, to shed light on that. Mm -hmm. We talked a bit about the, the scene staging. If you could speak any more on that or what the implications are of that. So uh, 
we can start with the open door in the rear of the residence that the officer found and the knocked over telescope. Uh, so I visited the residence uh, a couple months back. Uh, actually lifted that telescope up. It weighs about 25 to 30 pounds. It's a very, very large telescope. The floors there are wooden floors. If that telescope fell from the height at which it sat, uh, it would have made a significant mark on the ground. Uh, just n- knowing with my kids and, and, and floors, uh, hardwood floors, the mark that those things would make. And there are no noticeable marks of where that would have landed if it had been knocked over. That is why our belief is that that was staked there. Secondly, we're looking through the bathrooms that were ransacked, tons of medicine things thrown into the sink, but nothing noticeably taken, specifically jewelry, money that was left behind. The one thing that was taken was a 19-inch flat screen small TV, which I think is pertinent because that is the closest, I guess, valuable object to the front door. Understood. And then, of course, her phone, it sounds like, was taken. And her phone was gone, right. Right. And her purse, which was also dumped on the couch, right. Uh, But nothing else taken other than the cell phone. Just for our listeners who may not be so familiar with this, you know, in terms of the importance of a perpetrator staging a scene, how does that influence how law enforcement then, you know, views the underlying crime when there's this attempt at sort of almost deflection? It's common, actually. You look at most of your crime shows, and you see a lot of the staging to throw off law enforcement. Like, somehow, that's going to change something. But this particular incident, it's even, to me, it's even more obvious because what wasn't stolen and what they take is a 19-inch flat-screen TV that Peggy could have been overpowered to steal and, and leave. I mean, there's no reason to kill her over a a 19-inch flat-screen TV. Right, and and what kind of burglar would even be in an area like that at that time of year? Uh, Again, it's off the beaten path. It's summertime. It it just doesn't make sense, that that scenario, to us anyway. The media reports we've seen seem to indicate that there is a main suspect in this case. Is that an accurate assessment of the situation? That's accurate. I've said before on the beast that We have developed a suspect, but I I don't go into details about that at this point in time. Mm -hmm. One other thing we've kind of gotten from the media reports is just that, you know, there's a sense that you guys are close to an arrest and and the case is very much far from cold. Is that fair to say? I told on the PeopleTV.com interview, and I always say that for reference sake because everybody can see it. It's not a cold case for me. I don't even use that term. What law enforcement doesn't like to use is the term unsolved. We don't like that because it makes us feel like we're not doing our job. So it's an unsolved case for me and my partner, John Grassa. Of course, we dedicate time to that case. You have to understand that myself and John, we inherited this case. So this, again, happened in 2017, but I was not transferred to investigations until April of 2020. And then John came along in October 2021. So it's new to me. And so part of that process is starting all over again. And so not only are there two new sets of eyes, but also there's two new sets of personalities that guide an investigation. So there are some things that my predecessors may have missed or missed an opportunity on, and because of their focus, right, their focus of the evidence is taking them this direction. But when John and I received the case, well, we have the value of hindsight now, but also there's things that we discovered. And then with our experience, we take it to a different direction, again, based on the evidence, not what we're trying to make fit. We've talked about the fact that, you know, you mentioned some of the press coverage this case has gotten. It's also gotten some coverage on social media. Sometimes misinformation gets out there. So I'm just curious, are there any bits of misinformation out there about this case that you would like to dispel? Well, do you have any examples of the misinformation? Because sincerely, I only know what I've given to different media. Is there something more specific that you would like to ask that we can address? Honestly, off the top of our heads, no. I think the media coverage on this case has been pretty adhering to seemingly having sources within law enforcement and kind of citing those. And so, you know, we just always ask that because things can really get into rumor mill territory sometimes, but I wouldn't say I noticed anything that seemed egregious. And we've mostly kind of confirmed with you some of the basic details that we read in the media. So I think, I think we're probably good. 
let, let me add to that. So official comments come from law enforcement, not from media, you know, that type of thing. Mm-hmm. So anything that's out there from law enforcement or interviews combined with law enforcement and family members. Also, I'd like to point out that initially the FBI was not invited in this because at the time my predecessors believed they had the right direction they were going. But later on, they were invited and they've been very big help to us along the way from forensics and saying that in the state of Virginia, there's like three state labs to analyze things. And so there's a back order of things. And so not only do they help us with that, but we also get their insights. So previously it was Andrew Manson. Now it's uh, Agent Mark Matthews. Now we get to tap into Mark's experience and the type of things they have to get this investigation to a point where we can indict and prosecute. Understood. And and this might be a question more for Mark, but in terms of partnering, and because this really does seem like a partnership and a collaboration between local and federal authorities here. Absolutely. But when the when the FBI is kind of deciding, okay, you know, getting the invite, can you come in and work with us on this? You know, what sort of parameters do you take as far as cases that you end up kind of collaborating on in that regard? Are you asking which cases we choose to collaborate on? Yeah. I mean, if there's no obvious like federal jurisdiction, is it just like if you're asked, you you know, you try to come in and provide resources? Is that kind of how you guys tend to operate? Absolutely. We work hand in hand with our locals and state locals all the time in, in many different aspects. The FBI has specific cases that are titled for law enforcement assist, which on the agent side in terms of investigative is not a heavy list for us. That is simply mostly putting stuff into the system and sending it to our expert resources, specifically the lab or cell phone analysis, the behavioral analysis unit we utilize a lot to help local resources who don't have access to that kind of professional resource. So we we will choose, uh, if we're asked to come into an investigation like this one that is so important to the uh, local community and the county there, then we will assist as best we can. In terms of the, I guess, the a cause of death. I want to go back to that for a moment. Um, we mentioned blunt force trauma and then kind of exsanguination due to that. This is kind of just off the top of my head, but that that almost sounds like, I mean, if she had been found potentially earlier, could she have survived? And does that tell us anything about the crime if the per- perpetrator left the scene when she was potentially still alive? Well, well with, with my limited medical knowledge, since she fled to death. Is there a possibility if she was found sooner it could survive? I would say possibly, yeah. yeah. Um, but again, it's crime. And so that's the whole point is that she's not discovered, right? Mm-hmm. So the likelihood of someone discovering her sooner was low. You, you understand what I'm saying? Because of the location, right. people aren't just going back there to that area. The murderer knows that too, that isolation aspect of it. Right, right. Yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. And I know the FBI and sort of the public communications on this case on the website notes that you're looking for people. She was known to communicate activity occurring near the residence at the time of the murders. What kind of message can we put out to the public? What information would be most helpful at this time to the investigation? Well, there's someone out there that, that knows something, right? We always encourage people to come forward, but in saying that, what happens is, and I'm sure Mark has experienced this too, you know, you're hoping for the anonymous call, the anonymous tip that leads you to something, right? Something credible and prosecutable. But a lot of times what happens is that you have to filter people that have an opinion and you have to filter people that are not exactly in the right mind. And so they use this as a platform to receive attention. And so that's a process. And that takes a lot of time. And so we're always looking for information. We hope that this podcast reaches people in a way that other platforms haven't and has an effect on their soul. We want them to get to a point where they just can't go on knowing what they know. And they shouldn't have to carry it anymore. They should want to call in anonymously even to get that off their chest to assist us in this investigation. That's how things get done. You see time and time again, law enforcement reaches out to the public. Someone knows something out there. And it could be something they think is small, but actually is the difference between showing the murder to be a liar or not, right? One more step closer to an indictment or a prosecution or a conviction. As far as getting you guys the information you need, the tips you need, what's the best way for people to 
if they have information to reach out and provide that. The Middlesex County Sheriff's Office dedicated tip line is 804-758-5600. The FBI's tip line is 1-800-CALL-FBI or tips at fbi.gov. Or you can call the Richmond office directly at 804-261-1044. I have sort of two more questions for you. Um, And you guys have been amazing. I just want to say thank you so much for this. And I really hope that we can get this word out there to people who might be able to kind of help. In terms of looking at Peggy's life and, and sort of victimology in order to sort of learn more about what may have happened to her, what sort of information can we look at here? It sounds like she had no enemies. She was a caring person who was taking care of her dad right recently, you know, b- before her death. And and just, I mean, do you have any thoughts on like how a thing like this could happen to someone like that? Criminals have different motives. So everything you just said, I'll say this. So aside from a serial killer, murderers usually know the people they kill. And you're filling in a lot of your own answers with that. She had no enemies. People loved her. She loved her children. And so you have to look around to see what a person's motives are, right? And I know, and I I don't want to get into a lot of of that, so I guess I really can't answer the question besides by answering with your own question are all the facts you just laid out. Motives can be a strange thing sometimes or a very direct thing, but but I guess my point is is that Mark and I and John Grasso, we, we have all that information. So I will say this. Suffice to say that we have developed motives. There's no doubt that we've developed that. But I, again, I don't want to go into all that. Yep. Un- understood completely. It's an ongoing investigation and, you know, definitely, definitely respect and get that. You know, we talked a bit about how Peggy was and, and sort of what she meant to people. My, my two part question for the three of you is, can you tell us about the impact of her murder on those who cared about her, her kids and, and p- others who cared about her, as well as how this case has impacted each of you as investigators who are working on it. Oh, absolutely. So Ann Ferguson, her sister, wrote a long time ago in the email to our office how the news, just the news alone, devastated her. Jay Lammers, the son, has not been back to the River House since this has happened. In fact, the house is deteriorating. It's sitting there, not sold, sitting there deteriorating as we speak. There's a huge void in Ann Jordan's life, AJ, Presley's life, the other daughter, and Ann Ferguson's life. The list continues. The partnership with the FBI in our office going back to Ohio with Mark's predecessor, Andrew Manson, where they interviewed her friends. And they're confounded because of all the things we know why this would happen to her. And again, that goes back to the other question about motive, which we have developed. And I have to leave it like that. But how can you measure devastation, right? The void in their lives. It's unfathomable. You know, you see on TV shows where you have an arrest, a conviction, and sometimes you'll hear the person say, well, it's lose-lose, right? Because the family still lost their loved one. This person that did it has lost out on life. It's just devastation all the way around. The best thing that we're looking for is justice, right? Mm -hmm. That That's the win part, is the indictment, a prosecution that leads to a conviction. And then I wanted to open it up to all three of you and just ask, is there anything we didn't ask about? So I will say this, that I have mentioned the person of interest, but we have also eliminated other people along the way. And we're all confident here that we are going to make an arrest in this case. And I would also continue to plead for help because I'm in contact with Jay Lammers, Ann Ferguson, Presley. I'm in contact with the family quite often to keep them updated. And so if something comes to them, they know they can call us or vice versa. But until it's in a courtroom, it's an open investigation and we're open minded. In other words, we don't fit to what I think we follow the evidence. And so evidence can turn on a dime. Keep that in mind. It can turn on a dime. But again, to reiterate, we do have a person of interest. We have eliminated certain people, and we are confident that we will make an arrest in this case. I just want to thank the three of you for just sharing your insights about this case with us. I really hope this is helpful and can at least get the word out. And just thank you for your time and for uh, the work you're doing on this case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
As the investigators said, they need the public's help with this one. Please, if you have information about what happened to Peggy, don't sit on it. Her family is waiting for answers about what happened to her in that river house six years ago. Don't make them wait any longer. Call the Middlesex Sheriff's Office dedicated tip line at 804 758 5600. Call the FBI field office in Richmond, Virginia at 804 261 1044. You can also reach the FBI at the email address tips at fbi.gov or the phone number 1 800 call FBI. Again, Please do not sit on what you know. Thanks to Chris, John, Mark, and Danette for this interview. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murder sheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for the murder sheet and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet Discussion Group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening. Hello, Murder Sheet listeners. Thank you so much for sticking with us until the very end. Just wanted to take a moment as we close out to thank our sponsor, HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. They are number one for a reason, folks. Kevin and I have been loving the meals we're getting from HelloFresh. We're talking farm fresh produce, protein, all sorts of customizable options to get you exactly what you and your family need. It's very delicious, it's very nutritious. And it's quite affordable. So it ticks off all our boxes. We've been very happy with the service. And, you know, would love for you guys to try it out if you're curious or if you've tried it out in the past and enjoyed it. You know, get that discount. It's HelloFresh.com slash MSheet16. And then you're going to plug in the code MSheet16. You get 16 free meals plus free shipping. You can't beat that. We've really been delighted by it. We work very hard on the podcast. It takes up a lot of time. It's our it's our small business. Um, we really enjoy the work. We enjoy conversing with all of you every week. Um, but at the same time, it's nice for Kevin and I to kind of have something to do outside of office hours. And uh, cooking these meals has been really fun. We're terrible in the kitchen, like disastrous. I mean, like I, I, I can tell you horror stories. You know, I, I mean, I, I probably shouldn't get into it on the podcast, but I mean, some pretty... Some pretty disastrous moments involving our cooking, <laughs> you know, n- nothing, nothing life threatening, but definitely stuff that we we tried to be overly ambitious about, and it either went horribly wrong or it ended up costing like way more than it should have because we didn't properly like think about ingredients and uh, we're not we're not gifted in in the realm of the kitchen, but HelloFresh makes us pretend like we are because everything is so pre-portioned and pre-planned and the instructions are super clear. So like, you're not going to mess it up if you're like us. And if you're, if you're good in the kitchen, then it's just, it's just less of a hassle and and you get everything that you need. You don't have to run out to the grocery store. So super nice. Um, Try it out. I've really enjoyed the meals that they've sent us so far. I can say that Kevin has too. I highlight that because Kevin is pretty picky when it comes to food. He does not he does not like everything. He has he has pretty strong specifications and preferences. Very much cares about things like fresh produce and and farm produce and things like that. So, he's very picky and I think the fact that he is really enjoying HelloFresh is a testament to the quality here because he's a stickler for that kind of thing. Um and so if you are, I think you will enjoy it as well. And again, the uh, URL and promo code that'll get you a sweet discount is 
hellofresh.com slash msheet16. That's M-S-H-E-E-T 16. And use code msheet16. You're going to get 16 free meals plus free shipping. We hope you enjoy it. And again, thank you so much for 